<laughs> uh, yes, you are. Come on. Uh, so let's um, then let's just proceed as we are without. I think. Yeah, it's going to have to be video, uh, audio, I think. Um, so. Hey, you are on. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today, only by audio, as it turns out, um, about something I've had a lot of experience with throughout my life, and especially uh, lately, grief and mortality. So as some of you know, um, after more than 30 years with your know, wonderful husband, life partner, who was in apparently outwardly perfect health, I lost him in one instant early last year massive heart attack. Um, and I lost my father to lung cancer just a few weeks later, and that left me without any immediate family. I, I don't have any children. I was the only child. I have no siblings. My closest relatives now are <clears throat> cousins, in-laws, and I suppose my Dharma brothers and sisters at this center <laughs> are maybe some of my closest relatives now. Um, Nothing can prepare a person for that kind of loss, you know, the sudden unexpected loss of somebody who, with whom they've shared most of their life. Fortunately, I've also practiced Zen for most of my life, and that's helped me make it through that loss. Um, and that loss has had a pretty significant impact on my practice. So I wanted to give this talk today and, and hope that my experience with grief and mortality might be of some use to others in facing those same losses that we all that come with life, you know. So to start, I have a confession to make. Um, I probably shouldn't be allowed to give a Dharma talk at a respectable Zen center like this. I'm not a very good Buddhist. Um, to give you an idea of what a bad Buddhist I am, I will admit to you right now that I don't even believe the first noble truth of Buddhism. I, I, I don't even get to truth number one. Life is suffering. I just don't buy that. Um, now I'm no Zen master, right? I'm far from that. So somebody, Sensei Roshi can correct me if I'm wrong, but part of my understanding of Zen practice is that we don't make distinctions. You know, we don't divide existence into good and bad, light and dark, this and that, we just let experience speak for itself. We don't label it, we don't judge it. And yet the very truth of our religion is like this subjective, dualistic, value-laden pronouncement about how life isn't to our liking. Um, and not only that, it's like the worst marketing slogan ever. <laughs> you know, hey everyone, life is suffering, come have some tea. You know, it's a wonder America has any Buddhist sanghas at all. Um, now, Christians, they know how to market their product. Buddhists believe life is suffering because joy never lasts. Christians believe life is joy because suffering never lasts. So, like, which of those coffee hours sounds better to you? <laughs> this is why I still go to church. In fact, I still consider myself a fairly de devout Christian or to be specific, a devout Episcopalian, which, which is a little bit like being a, a radical moderate, but I still have my, my uh, feet in the Christian church as well as in this Zen saga. But here's the problem for me as a Buddhist Christian or a Christian Buddhist. I don't quite buy the first noble truth of Christianity either. Like I can't quite bring myself to believe life is joy or suffering. So which is it? What is life besides just life? What can we say about it? Well, here's my all-time favorite Zen story. It's from the teaching of Shunryu Suzuki, and some of you may be familiar with this story, but I'll, I'll tell it. So one evening, Suzuki was giving a lecture, and someone in the audience said, Roshi, you know, all your teaching sounds very good but I'm just having a hard time getting my head around the whole thing. Could you please just sum it up in one sentence? Could you sum Zen up in a sentence? And you know, what a completely ludicrous question, right? The crowd erupted in laughter, including the questioner and including the Roshi. 
But then when the laughter died down, Suzuki leaned forward and said, everything changes. Now, when I first read that story, I thought, well, there it is. That's the first truth of Buddhism and the first truth of Christianity summed up, not in one sentence, but in two words, everything changes. Suffering changes, joy changes. There's no landing place, there's no finality, the book never shuts. My late husband loved this Minneapolis rock band called Trip Shakespeare. They were later known as Semisonic. Semisonic had a big hit called Closing Time and it had a line in it that went, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And that was a bit of a slogan for him and me. Um, and that's Zen, you know. You've heard the saying that nothing in life is certain except death and taxes. But there are plenty of wealthy people with really good financial advisors who don't pay any taxes. And even the existence of death can be sort of a tricky question if we look really hard at it. I mean, how much do we know about uh, death, really? No one alive has ever experienced it. So I think what Suzuki Roshi said is the real truth about life. The only thing in life that's certain is that nothing is certain. Nothing is certain except change. So I've had a life marked by a lot of loss, as I've mentioned, but also a lot of rejuvenation and growth too. And what all that's taught me is that change isn't bad news and it isn't good news. It, it isn't suffering and it isn't joy. But it is one thing we can absolutely count on. Change is something we can even take refuge in, I think. And that's something I've held on to um, in my life. I got a really early introduction into the truth of mortality and that this truth of everything changes. Um, and that happened during the last big global ep epidemic. So I was in the highest risk group for that one. Uh, I came out as a gay man in my early 20s, just as I graduated from college. And it was the worst possible timing because right when I came out, actually right after I came out, so did this disease called AIDS. So now AIDS wasn't as easy to contract as COVID-19 is. You know, it wasn't floating in the air or sitting on a doorknob. But if you got it, you were dead, you know, and, and it took science 14 years to find an effective treatment for, a, for HIV. For 14 years after I came out, the mortality rate of AIDS was 100%. And worse than that, I was exposed to the disease before I'd ever heard what it was. Um, by the time news of AIDS reached Milwaukee, which was my hometown, um, I briefly dated a man who'd fallen ill and he died from AIDS about a year later. And there was no way of knowing if I'd contracted it from him. Because if you think we're behind on testing for COVID-19, imagine this. After the discovery of AIDS, it took science three years to even invent a test for it. I mean, the problem is nobody cared too much that a bunch of perverts were dying of something. I mean, ACT UP had to organize a march on the National Institutes of Health before the American Medical Association was willing to issue a statement that doctors had an ethical obligation to treat AIDS. <laughs> That's how reluctant the medical community was. And that was after six years of people dying. So not only did it take years for that testing and medical care to ramp up, but it, it turned out the disease itself wasn't very immediate either. In some cases, years could pass before symptoms appeared. You know, symptoms of COVID-19 appear within 14 days. It could be two, three, four years before HIV symptoms appeared. And that's without a test that subjected all people to years of not knowing if they were infected. I mean, years of the specter of death sort of sitting on your shoulder and whispering in your ear, you know. So my early adulthood was spent wondering if any sneeze or sniffle meant I was going to die. Um, and I mean, not just from a virus anyone might get, like COVID, but from a disease that marked you as an outcast, you know, at a time when, the, when gay rights were 
very a new thing. You know, back then a cold or flu would hit me and I, you know, I would be convinced that I was going to have to go tell my Catholic mother who was from rural Italy, not only that what I was gay, but that I was going to die from it. In those days, I would get sick with anything. Um, I would pray to die from, for some, from something else. I'd pray to have anything but AIDS. I, I would say in my, I would say, please God, give me cancer. <laughs> That's how desperate those days were for me and for the thousands of other men who had that same bad coming out timing. And while all that was happening, the disease started taking hold among the gay community in Milwaukee and in Chicago. You know, this was my friends, it was my gay family. You know, if you didn't see somebody out in the bars for a few weeks, you wondered, are, you, are we ever going to see him again? You wondered what happened. Has anybody heard from so-and-so? You know, we'd ask. And then we'd appoint somebody to go check up on that person, you know. Uh, every week, the gay newspapers would carry obituary listings, obituary pages, and they would get longer and longer and longer. I remember Thursdays at happy hour, um, when the weekly gay paper in Milwaukee would dropped at the bars, which was the community centers of the gay scene back then. And everybody would rush to grab the gay newspaper. And then we would all read the names aloud. And we would have little impromptu barstool memorials for, for the names we recognized. You know, people would say, oh my gosh, Larry died. Did anybody else here know Larry? and we would have a little barstool funeral for Larry. Um, I was reminded of those days many years later, um, recently when my father entered a retirement home about six or seven years ago. Um, at the nightly meals in the dining hall, the residents of his home would talk about who in the home had become injured or fallen ill or, or had died. One night I was having dinner with my father and his buddies at the home and one of the guys, one of his friends said, my God, it's all we talk about. Who fell? Where did they fall? How did it happen? Where are they now? <laughs> that, was their, that was their topic of conversation. Well, that was just like the conversations in the gay bars at the time of AIDS. It was very similar, except we were in our 20s and 30s, not our 80s and 90s. It was like we'd hit old age in our youth. You know, mortality was staring us right in the face of way before we were ready. Now, I hadn't started practicing Zen back then, um, but living through the early era of AIDS was sort of my first long sashin, my first long retreat. And eventually it did bring me to a sort of mini Kensho, sort of a small, moment of enlightenment. Um, when HIV goes untreated, it can cause sores in the mouth and on the throat. And at one point back in those days, I developed a bad open sore on my throat. I was certain that this was AIDS. Um, and in the middle of a sleepless night when that was going on, I had my first thought about suicide. I thought about killing myself. I figured even if the painful thing on my throat didn't turn out to be AIDS, I didn't know if I was up for living through the anxiety of finding out, you know, through the slow realization of this one way or the other. But right then in sort of that moment of surrender, I realized that I was giving AIDS to myself. Like whatever I was putting myself through with my thoughts and fears was as bad, if not worse, than AIDS itself, you know? And like the disease itself, these thoughts and these fears were gonna kill me if I didn't do something about them. In that moment, that's when I accepted the fact that there was nothing I could do about the past. There was nothing I could do about the possibility of having caught that virus. But until there was a test for it, I could treat the AIDS I was creating in my mind. I could change my thoughts, and my thoughts didn't have to kill me. They didn't have to be fatal. That realization um, of disease being as much in your mind as your body sort of transformed my fear. 
I remember I sat on the edge of my bed that night and I kind of laughed at myself at this whole absurd situation I was creating in my head. I was still scared of AIDS, still scared of dying of it, but I thought I could at least cure the AIDS of my thinking if I, and, and then I, I could take my chances with the actual virus, you know. I'd try to stay safe, even though science didn't even really have that quite figured out either. And maybe, maybe I would survive the virus itself. At least I could give myself that chance. So the most amazing thing was I fell fast asleep that night after I had that realization. And by the time I woke up in the morning, that bad sore on my throat was just about gone. It was barely noticeable, and it was no longer painful. Um, after having plagued me for, you know, I, I had been struggling for days with this thing. So I had made it a doctor's appointment for later that morning to check out my throat. And I, I had found a doctor a friend had recommended who was open to treating gay men, and he was sensitive about AIDS. And that was a precious thing in Milwaukee then. There were not very many doctors who weren't going to judge you for this. So even though this thing on my throat had mostly healed, I kept the appointment anyway. And I went and I told the doctor the story of that previous night. And he shook his head kind of sadly and said that he was seeing this sort of thing over and over and over. Uh, he said severe anxiety depresses the immune system just like AIDS does. And to the extent that worried gay men were presenting in his office with the same symptoms as the disease, some of the same, the very same symptom, because symptoms, because AIDS was a disease of immune suppression. However, he could tell that most of these men probably didn't have AIDS because their general health was still good. He said if they went and got counseling and started dealing with their anxiety, usually their physical symptoms would go away, you know, just like this sore had gone away with me when I got hold of my thoughts. That's when I first became fascinated with this relationship between mind and body. And that's really planted the seed for Zen to take hold, even though I'd never heard of Zen yet. Now, around that time, I met Hal, and it's the man with whom I would spend the next 30 years. Um, in those years, monogamy was the best preventive medicine from AIDS, it was, for AIDS. It was really the only treatment we had. And Hal and I sort of became each other's lifeboat in the storm. You know, even my Italian mother, after I kind of came out, ended up loving Hal. <laughs> and she began to think that maybe having a gay son as her only child wasn't all that bad, thanks to our relationship. Uh, but we couldn't keep AIDS out of our lives. Uh, unfortunately, Hal's younger brother contracted it. And we eventually took him into our home and became his caregivers. Um, so the three of us ended up having many special moments together through that. But it, it was obviously really hard, too. And it was really hard, especially at the beginning. I was juggling the three-day-a-week commute to Chicago trying to start a PhD at the University of Chicago, uh, a very high pressure academic program. And at that time I started to suffer again, um, not from fear of my own death, but by that time I had tested negative, the test had come along and I had tested negative. But I was just stressed out about our brother's illness, the whole hopeless situation of surrounding gay men and AIDS, people dying all around me and that stress of that plus my academic pressures started to turn into depression. So the University of Chicago was offered free counseling to students. And so in desperation, I, I made an appointment to go see a counselor. The counselor said, well, we can't do much about your life situation, you know? Um, we can't cure AIDS, we can't cure your brother. But what we can treat is your stress. And she said I should go to Regenstein Library on campus and check out a small booklet called Breathing, <laughs> How to Breathe. And I walked out of her office and I was like, that's the best she's got? 
you know, take a few deep breaths. I mean, I left that office more depressed than when I came in, but I had nothing to lose. So I went and got that booklet. Um, and miracle of miracles, that breathing helped. Focusing on my breath created like just enough of a little gap between my thoughts and everything else that was going on in my life that a little bit of air and light got in there. Uh, it didn't make all my problems go away, but it got me out of the worst of my depression and it made me able to function again. Now the breathing exercise in that book that helped me the most came with a little footnote and the footnote said, similar to meditation practices in Zen Buddhism. Well, I think over the next several months, I ended up reading every book on Zen in the seminary co-op bookstore on the University of Chicago campus. And if you're familiar with that bookstore, you know that's a lot of books. I really threw myself into it. I threw myself into meditation like my life depended on it, and it sort of did. I mean, it wasn't self-improvement, it was self-preservation. It got me to the next day and the next, you know. And eventually, without me really being conscious of it, it started to have an impact um, beyond helping me just with my stress and my depression. Several years later, um, I was with my husband's family and we were gathered around uh, his brother's deathbed, you know. And when he breathed his last, I, I cried and I mourned with all the rest of the family. But when somebody said, we'll never be with him again, as sad as I was, I had a thought that, huh, I don't think I quite believe that. I don't know if, I don't know if I quite believe that, that this guy is gone. Not that I had developed any kind of belief in reincarnation. I mean, all that complicated Tibetan Buddhist stuff, you know, that's tended to lose me. I would chuck that book away and go back to Zen. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't get into it. And I'd also drifted away from church and any sort of a belief in a Christian af afterlife. I mean, at that time, churches mostly believed AIDS was what gay men deserved. You know, openly gay men weren't very welcome in churches. So I'd kind of grown out of believing that one day, you know, Hal's brother and I would hug each other on a cloud. I mean, that wasn't what I believed either. I didn't believe anything at all, really. I, I just had a feeling that whatever I was connecting with, when I loosened my attention from my thoughts in meditation, whatever that was, was something I could never not be a part of. No one, nothing could ever not be a part of that, not through life, not through death. The universe was just this big ball of stuff happening that included everyone and everything always. I just had this feeling, I developed this feeling about it, that death didn't end you, it caught you. It was only an end from like our limited small viewpoint as one human being. Now, that didn't make the loss of our brother like a hooray moment. I mean, Hal and I were still around, and his brother wasn't, and we missed him a lot, you know, missed him terribly. But that, I, my Zen practice, even as new as it was back then, and even, even as many mistakes as I was making trying to strive after enlightenment, things like that, um, it kept that loss short of being despair, short of being hopeless. Now, I, I didn't know exactly where Hal's brother went, where our brother went, but I had a feeling it wasn't oblivion. Like, and compared with oblivion, I don't know was okay. I could live with I don't know if I knew it wasn't annihilation. That's when I went and joined a Zen Sangha. And eventually I went back to church too, when churches started to turn gay welcoming. Um, I realized what some Zen practitioners, that what some Zen practitioners call the absolute, you know, the, this infinite maelstrom of 
unchanging change <laughs> that we touch when we meditate, that's something that we can never not be part of. For me, that was what I always saw from my puny little human standpoint as God. Like I never believed in God as a guy with a beard on a cloud. That thing, the absolute, that one ball of change, that's what I saw as God. And I went back to church to experience that. Um, and meditation became a form of prayer as well. Better than words, way better than words, you know. So having survived those years, Helen and I thought we would grow old together. Um, that did not turn out to be the case. Um, his vehicle had an engine defect, uh, defect in the engine, you know, and it conked. Um, I didn't get to be his caregiver. He died of a one second illness, my husband. So I wish I could tell you that after almost 30 years of Zen practice, I took that in stride, right? Well, I think it cushioned the initial shock of losing my husband. I mean, I didn't think Hal's spirit had been annihilated. I did not weep uncontrollably or inconsolably at the funeral. I mean, I gave his eulogy and I got through it without breaking down. But I think that that better than normal first phase of grief caused sort of a worse than normal second phase. Um, which is the realization phase when you slowly come to understand that your beloved is not on a long vacation, you know, is not coming back, not in his previous form. I mean, my Zen practice and my Christian faith were of, are of great comfort in helping me understand that, that my husband is not gone in an absolute sense, you know, but that doesn't make it easy to be without him in a relative sort of everyday sense. Spending 30 years with someone, you know, the two lives become so intertwined. And when that's ripped away in an instant, it just leaves a million little holes and loose ends that you have to account for. And in grasping for some constant to hold on to after that happened, I, I threw myself into caregiving for my father. And then he passed away eight weeks later. Um, after my father passed, alone in the house, I sort of began to get stuck in my grief. I was spinning my wheels, you know. I got mired in loops of thinking that I knew were irrational, but that I couldn't just seem to pull myself out of. Um, one loop of thinking was, well, there's no point in anything good happening if I can't share it with hell, you know. Another loop of thinking I was caught in was, if I feel good, it means I'm not grieving enough. You know, it means I didn't love Hal enough. So that was sort of a destructive loop of thinking I was caught in. Another loop I was caught in was thinking sort of, well, the good old days are over. You know, I'm just playing out the string now. I'll never be truly happy again. You know, it'll all pale next to what Hal and I had. So I didn't have thoughts of suicide this time around, but I did have thoughts of why go on? You know, what, what is the point? I had thoughts of life being kind of over, regardless of the fact that I was still walking and talking. In retrospect, I know that this is all another way of saying I'd come to this mistaken belief that my grief was never going to end. I'd lost touch with the very first truth of reality that everything changes. Um, fortunately, I was rational enough to know that I needed some help besides the family and friends who were supporting me, but were also grieving. You know, I needed some broader help because uh, we couldn't all cure each other. Now, I'd never really been able to find the right Zen group in Milwaukee. Um, but around that time, this Zen book caught my eye on, the, on a bookstore shelf, Appreciate Your Life. I thought, wow, could I ever use that right now? And I picked it up, and that book by Taizan Maizumi Roshi, it led me to y'all. It led me to the Zen Life and Meditation Center, an hour and a half from my house. You know, I jumped in the car and went to a 
workshop in overcoming um, obstacles in life, and I've I've just kept coming back. Um, renewed practice <clears throat> with a sangha and with good teachers did really help me get a toehold back into life. It helped stop me from sinking. Uh, I also joined an awesome Episc Episcopal church in my neighborhood that's been growing under the care of this rocking progressive former Catholic priest, you know. I found a grief support group um, in my neighborhood where somebody could say, oh yeah, yeah, I went through that, Bob, here, have a cookie. You know, that made a big difference. And more recently, I've joined a bereavement group on Zoom through the New York Zen Center, which is the same lineage as our Zen Center. Their, um, their guiding teacher, uh, Chodo Campbell, is a bereavement counselor, and he, he holds bereavement groups regularly at the New York Zen Center, and he's having one on, and because of COVID, they're, it's, they're on Zoom right now. I tried one, and it's, I, I'm in one, and it's really wonderful. Um, it's amazing what community can do. Um, I mean, being with others is kind of a form of meditation. Um, it's a form of connecting with what's beyond the self. It's, it's, it's focusing your, your attention away from your loop of thoughts. I've also been in the uh, Commit to Sit group here at the center that's been um, meditating together through this pandemic every morning, seven o'clock on Zoom. And I'll tell you, I never dreamed how much better and easier Zen would be, not even in the physical presence of other people, but in the presence of electronic representations of other people, you know, some of whom only look like their names. Uh, but it really, really um, is, a, is an a, amazing support to practice. I know a lot of other people that have been sitting in the morning feel the same way. It's been a great experiment in what Zen community is and um, how the way that we mix with each other is so much more than just physical, than just being in a room with each other. So the air of grief still, though, wasn't quite clearing. I, I still couldn't shake the last bouts of those thinking loops especially when I would hit a busy stretch um, in my teaching job at the University of Wisconsin, where and connecting with others was hard. When, when work would start to consume me, I would drift back into, into sadness and, these, and this kind of destructive thinking. And I was needing one last push, right? And boy, did I get it. And I got it from mortality itself. Um, Hal had never been one to go to the doctor, you know. Uh, we'll never know if a checkup would have saved his life. Uh, but I decided I was going to get caught up with my medical tests, you know, uh, after he died. And the very last one on my list back in February turned up cancer. Uh, I asked the doctor, how bad is it? Cancer, how bad is it? He said, well, you know, so far as I can tell by eye, it looks re relatively early and small. But this polyp has grown in your intestinal wall, which means there's a chance it's spread elsewhere. So we're gonna to have to do a CAT scan to see if it's reached out of the other organs. And we're gonna do surgery to cut this thing out and, um, and a piece of your intestine with it. And then we'll biopsy all that, the nodes and the tissue around it, and we'll figure out what's going on. And I said, well, I mean, could I die from this? And he said, well, Let's see what the tests bring back. So, whoa, right? And suddenly I had my answer as to what could make the rest of life worth living. You know, the smell of the morning coffee, the fresh snow glistening in the trees outside, the squirrels chasing each other around my yard. All the little pleasures of living turned into pleasures again. Why? because I was in danger of losing them, because they're impermanent, and because everything changes. So I had my scans and I had my surgery and no cancer turned up except inside this one little polyp they first spotted. 
So I have no more treatment scheduled. I'm not going to be in chemotherapy. I'm not going to be in radiation. They're just going to observe me. I'm going to have more frequent screenings. So at some point, my body's going to die of something, but it doesn't appear to be cancer right this minute. <laughs> now, just as I was recovering from that surgery, COVID hit, and we, we've all been suspended animation ever since. But you better believe that when life starts back up, I'll have some fresh enthusiasm for living the rest of it. <laughs> I've really recaptured an appreciation for the continual gift of something new that Buddhists call in, impermanence. I've got a new Sangha, I've got a new church, new freedom, new possibilities. I've got a new mo motivation to share what I've gone through with others who might be going through it. Um, there's maybe even a new man, a dear friend of Hal's and mine, who's been sort of waiting for me to get my act together so that he might have a date. <laughs> He's in Mexico. There's no telling when COVID-19 or Donald Trump is going to let us cross that border. But I think the bigger border wall in my life to all things new is finally coming down. You know, Buddhists, I think, too often, when you read these books, it, it, they, too often impermanence sounds like a problem. It sounds like it's something that you're going to conquer over the course of a thousand lifetimes and finally get to nirvana where it's not an issue anymore. And yeah, I mean, loss is hard. You know, boy, don't I know it. But you know what would be way worse than impermanence? Permanence. I mean, can you imagine how ordinary life would be? I mean, how much we would take it for granted if life went on forever? I mean, if our lives were permanent, they would completely lose their specialness. They would lose their flavor. Our existence is precious, I think I've learned, exactly because it's temporary, because it's bound to change. I mean, what else but the passing of every moment would, would ever cause us to appreciate it? You know, even the memory of my husband is something, is, a, is among the aspects of like my new life that I'm coming to cherish. I, I'm, I'm never going to stop missing Hal, but I've come to realize that to let my thoughts get stuck in sadness over his absence doesn't leave any room for appreciation of his presence. And by his presence, I mean both the presence we shared for 32 you know, really lucky years together, but also his presence in memory that I feel much more strongly in the current moment now that I've gained at least a little bit of a handle on my grief. Now, this is going to sound very Hallmark card, but there are times, especially lately, where I feel that Hal is right next to me. Something will happen, and I'll hear an encouragement or a criticism or a cheer or a wisecrack, and I'll just feel like that's him, especially when it comes unbidden, you know, especially when I'm not consciously thinking about him. Now, a, a skeptic would say, oh, you know, that's all in your mind. I would ask the skeptic, what's not in your mind? You know, it's true, my, my memory of Hal isn't perfect. But I didn't grasp him perfectly when he was standing right in front of me either. I mean, he'd be the first to tell you that. If the universe is like this big ball of changing consciousness that nothing can ever not be a part of, that includes everything, everywhere, always. What exactly separates the memory of someone from their physical presence? I, I don't know, you know, I'm not a Zen master, but all I can say is coming through so much grief has made me feel like the veil between presence and memory, between like matter and thought, between life and death is at best, really thin and really translucent, much less solid than most people think. Just like the veil between everything is in the universe where the only constant is change. So, you know, may we never lose the ability to appreciate the interdependent sufferings and triumphs of an ever-changing universe. It's the one thing in life that we can really count on. 
So that's my talk. You thought you were getting a Dharma talk. Instead, you got my life story. So sorry about that. But thanks for listening. And it's really a privilege to be part of this Sangha. Um, I don't know if uh, it's actually, it's appropriate to ask for questions, but if people want to share something about their experience of loss and how that's shaped their practice or their lives, maybe this would be a good time. So thank you. Uh, Robert, that was definitely a Dharma talk. Absolutely. Absolutely beautiful, Robert. Thank you very, very much. I couldn't hear any of you, so I didn't know. I, For all I knew, Zoom was out. Thank you, Robert. Very much appreciated. Thank you. If I may, Robert, I didn't hear a life story versus a Dharma talk. I heard a life story that led you to the Dharma. Thanks. I mean, I'm really fortunate I discovered it. I'm so lucky I got that breathing book because I would not have been one to be a Zen, you know, like I would have seen that as new age at the time. And I'm still, you know, kind of skeptical sometimes about some of the Buddhist stuff, but I'm glad I gave it a chance. Well, one thing that Roshi pointed out very beautifully and clearly is how Zen is impacted by the culture in which it exists. And when you look at where a lot of these authors are coming from, it's important to understand the context in which they were teaching. Oh, so yeah. there's some way that you could maybe loosen the impact of culture from the teaching and kind of find what's underneath it, like everything changes. Mm -hmm. what's, what's most fundamental beyond all the bells and whistles? And one thing I want to share really quickly is I had uh, cancer and chemo when I was 18. And I was... struggling with what's true, what can I hold on to? And I came across self-help books, and I came across psychology, and I came across Zen. And that was a game changer for me as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the secret sauce of this Zen Center is that it, it updates the, te it puts the teachings in the current context. I mean, it, 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 it keeps the, it keeps the most important parts, but it, it, it um, I mean, I think that this center has done an amazing job at bringing all those teachings into the, the modern day. It's one of the things I really appreciate about it. Say, Robert? Yes. This is Mark. Um, I can see everybody's name. I just can't see your face. Yeah. Well, I'm the fellow Milwaukeean. Yes, I know. Yeah. I'm a Packer fan. Packers, yeah, Packers. Um, and the Bucks too. Yeah. Um, you know, this day and age, what you've gone through, what you have to share is very helpful for so many people who are losing loved ones now to the virus. Yeah. Family members and relatives, friends. Mm -hmm. uh, grief is probably the number one emotion besides stress and anxiety. Fear is grief. You bet. And I don't know if there's a way we can get your resources that helped you, but if we had those available, uh, there'd be many that could use um, what what you have gleamed and learned and helped been helped by. Well, when I was kicking around the house um, in between my cancer diagnosis and the tests, oh. and not knowing you know, what my situation was, I kind of made a promise to myself that if I got through this, that I would make it more of a mission to try and help, you know, bring um, whatever I'd learned to other people. So that's why I asked to give the Dharma, the Dharma talk was my idea. I mean, I asked Roshi and, and Mark yeah. if this was okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm glad they gave me the chance because it's something I really want to do. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. Robert, this uh, reason, if I, I can see a few of you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Robin. Uh, no, it's Susan. Oh, it was, it was Robin Shearer was lighting up on my screen. It's you, okay. Susan. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what a wonderful talk on so many levels. And um, 
I wrote down some notes, but I loved what you said that the way we mix with each other is so much more than the physical. I mean, yeah. that was really uh, timely because we have Zoom now. Um, and you, you could have meant that you also meant your mix with Hal now. You bet. Is oh. on. And Hal is very present and he's not in the physical. But then I, I thought a third level of that is in our practice, in our relationship, our relationality, our relation to everyone else um, does not depend uh, my relationship to some mother in Calcutta right at this moment does not depend on my being with her. So that sentence in itself, that thought, that statement was just so packed. And I thank you for that. Thanks. And you know, uh, quantum physics shows that, every, that what we do is affecting that person in Calcutta. <laughs> you know, everything we do... Um, affects everything else. That's, I've become very fascinated with quantum physics. It's almost like my third religion. <laughs> and it's about that interconnectivity and about how we're really only all part of one thing and our minds sort of control it. I mean, now with quantum physicists are determining that particles to behave differently according to how you view them. <laughs> you actually control them in a certain sense with your mind. So all that stuff. And yeah, I, I just feel, look, not to not to denigrate physical presence. It's really important. It's a great thing to have. I wish Hal was in front of me. Um, and I think when we sit together in the Dharma room, there's nothing like that. But boy, it's, there's a lot of different ways we can be present to each other than physical. And you called it the big ball of stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. That's my technical term. <laughs> that's my that's that's why I'm probably never going to write a Zen book. <laughs> <laughs> got the title right there. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Robert, just write your story. The Zen will be in there naturally. Yeah. I'm reminded of the idea when you, even a small pebble, you throw it into the lake and it has waves that re reach out. Uh, so what we think is small, a small act of compassion can be something that goes farther than we think. There's no question. I mean, and, and the effect of our lives just reverberates for centuries, every life, you know? I mean, and, and physics, not only is that Christianity, not only is that Buddhism, that's just plain old physics. Uh -huh. Robert, um, this is not Robin Shearer, this is Earl. <laughs> oh, hi, Earl. <laughs> Even though I'm showing up as Robin. <laughs> Robin right. I just wanted to thank you for such a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, really moving. It just goes to prove that you don't have to be a Roshi to be a, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. You certainly are. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Second that. Don't you know there's no teacher of Zen? <laughs> uh. <laughs> there's no such thing as a teacher in general. <laughs> That's not what it says on the website. <laughs> yeah, that's marketing. <laughs> that's, selling, that's selling water by the river. <laughs> I just want to say, one of the reasons I never got involved with the Zen Center in Milwaukee is we, there weren't any that were resident teachers. They were all drop-in teachers. They were all really small. We now, the Soto Zen uh, center up here now recently has a teacher who's become fully empowered, but we never had that. And what's one of the reasons I came to this center and uh, there might not be any teacher, but the fact that there's Zen master and Zen sensei in residence makes a big difference to the Zen center. It's, it makes a big difference. Yes. They are, they are the glue that holds it together. And we all, all we are all also the glue that holds it together. Yeah. Can I just share something else really quick? Sure. When Robert, when you were talking about the how we affect people that are in Calcutta with what we do, 
it reminds me of, and I've heard two different terms for it, interbeing or dependent co-arising I am because you are. Yep. The way you look at things impacts them. And this conversation we're having this morning, the way we're showing up internally, the experience we're having is because of each other, as, and more specifically you, Robert. We, we cannot coexist separately. Mm -hmm. so, it's so important. Yeah. I mean, I, my grief turned into a disease of isolation. And that was, that was the problem. Even as much as you can practice your whole life, but you can still get stuck in your own thought. Mm -hmm. And I practiced too much in isolation. And what really got me out of it was this center, really good church, some, some support outside the family because that was an echo chamber. They were suffering as badly as me, like Hal's family and, um, and, and uh, all my friends. And so it, the, the bigger you can connect, you know, the more you can connect with everything beyond yourself, I think the better off you are. And it doesn't always come easy for me either. I'm kind of a loner. But um, I'm, sometimes we have to go in uh, with our healing and reach out the best we can. But our time alone is not wasted. It makes no. us stronger. No, I mean, you need that, too. But it's yeah. just like everything. It's a middle path. Yeah, middle path. Yeah. Hey, Robert, Bob, thank you so much. I'm, I'm leaving now. I really saying goodbye to everybody, but Robert, yeah. particularly you, thank you so much this morning. This is Mark. Thanks Bye -bye. for listening. Yep, I can see you. Thanks for listening. This is also Mark. I'm going to be leaving too. Yeah, I think the time bell's ringing. It's 11. Good day to everyone. Bye. Bye. Well, Robert, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's June. I loved it. So important what you said, your whole process. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's Doug. Yeah. Thank you. It was very good. Thanks for being there. So, wish I could have seen you. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. As long as the message got through, it's fine. Uh, loud and clear. <laughs> yeah. Well, what can we do about Zoom? <laughs> it's not perfect. Neither is life, so it fits in well. Right. right. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs>